Hello everyone and welcome. We're so thrilled to welcome such a large group tonight. My name is Lauren Kraft and I partner with clients and clinicians to grow the Veterinary Medical Center's mission to serve animals and their families. On behalf of our team, I would like to welcome you to the first event of our new VMC Animal Health Education Series. This series features our leading experts covering a variety of topics in veterinary medicine, ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways that we're advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We also had over 200 pre-submitted questions and we'll do our best to cover the themes that came up most frequently during the final portion of the program today. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Christy Flynn. Dr. Flynn is Assistant Professor in the Veterinary Clinical Sciences Department of the College of Veterinary Medicine and a clinician in the VMC's Primary Care Service. She is a graduate of the University of Minnesota and has a particular interest in animal behavior, fear-free handling, and preventive medicine. We're grateful to have her here tonight to discuss ways to socialize your dog and read their body language. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Flynn. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this hour um, as we discuss dogs and dog behavior. Oops, sorry. Get my screen shared. All right, so um, we'll start by going all the way back and we'll kind of just briefly touch on the origins of the dog and how they came to be. Um, and then we'll kind of go into some considerations around our current sources of pet dogs, what some of the kind of pros and cons might be and how, you know, how that relates to social, socialization and how um, reading body language can be so important. And we'll really dig into the um, title, so the canine socialization and understanding that body language. And then we'll um, kind of discuss some ways that we can apply this to uh, real life living with our dogs. Um, so I guess I um, always thought like maybe you guys have like, and when I think about where dogs came from, I imagine early man, uh, like reaching into a, um, a wolf den and taking a pup and, rearing it to become a dog and over time these you know sort of like randomly selected um, wolves or common wolf ancestor more likely um, actually um, turn that into our today's dog um, and just kind of trying to always think of things um, as we learn more things new things um, thinking about it really from like the dog side of it so what an alternative hypothesis is that um, dogs or the early wolves or the common shared ancestor the ones that um, were more comfortable um, coming in closer to, so they predated um, agriculture. And so they'd be the ones that would come in closer to the human colonies and eat the carcasses or waste um, humans left behind from their hunting and gathering. And those ones would sort of breed with other ones that were more comfortable with being eating, basically eating closer to humans. And so maybe they actually kind of self-selected themselves rather than um, kind of the human um, vision of us making the dog. I kind of think it's interesting to think of it as they kind of chose us as well. Um, so um, we're going to listen to a, a little bit of a video um, of David Meech. He's a preeminent wolf researcher from Ely, Minnesota. Um, and um, just to hear um, him talk a little bit about um, pack hierarchy and um, kind of the, the common, I guess, myth about alpha dog or alpha wolf. Oh, sorry. Uh, the term alpha is, um, it isn't really accurate when uh, describing most of the um, leaders of, of wolf packs uh, because uh, it implies, the term implies uh, that uh, the wolves fought and um, competed strongly to get to the top of the pack. In actuality, the way they get there is merely by mating with a member of the opposite sex, uh, producing a bunch of offspring, which are the rest of the pack then, and uh, becoming the natural leaders that way, just like with a pair of humans producing a family. Instead of using the term alpha for a wolf, instead of saying alpha male or alpha female, uh, scientists now tend to call wolves like that the breeding male and the breeding female. 
and um, or you can call them the mother wolf and the father wolf. There's really nothing wrong with that. Uh, those are much better and more accurate terms than the term alpha. Um, so I guess um, it's just kind of interesting um, to actually hear it like from the expert that this thing that we often hear people attribute um, this personality trait of the dog being alpha or dominant or um, you know trying to one up us or something in order to run their little world <laughs> that's our house. Um, so it, it didn't even, it doesn't actually even apply to wolves. I think, you know, um, and then, so certainly it, we can't then apply that to dogs who are, have shared a common ancestor. Um, when, when we think of it as more of like a family structure, I can think of it like obviously um, within my family, my, most of my uh, motive is to kind of have my needs met and um, not to have these adversarial relationships within the family. And so I think it's a, it's kind of a good thing to kind of keep in mind and it can help us form these better relationships um, as individuals if we're not always looking for um, kind of conflict. It's kind of, again, a human centered thing, like, you know, we're fighting the, you know, climbing the corporate ladder and um, punitive society and things like that. So when we look at it, maybe from, um, from more of a, a perspective of, of sharing and, and um, just trying to have needs get met and not that they're trying to dominate us or anything. Um, and then when we do that, when we see things in that adversarial way, sometimes we rely on punishment or coercion and those things usually end up leading to fear and fear related aggression. So we're trying to make some undesirable behavior better by applying these methods that aren't based in what the underlying motivation really is. And then we can make things much, much worse. Um, just uh, um, kind of another, this is kind of an interesting experiment about domestication. So um, we know that um, this is sort of mirrors the, um, the early dog precursor in that um, there was a um, wolf farm, or sorry, a fox fur farm in Siberia where um, scientists um, selectively bred the tamest foxes the most social to humans, tolerant of humans. They bred them together for several generations. And within a very short period of time, um, they became almost dog-like. So seeking attention, um, showing a lot of the behaviors that we'll go into later that would let us know that these animals are comfortable um, being around people. And then uh, alternatively, they bred the more fearful, timid, reactive foxes to timid, fearful, reactive foxes. And they ended up get, seeing both extremes um, become more extreme and more consistent within um, litters. They um, uh, to sort of show that it was genetics and not necessarily, and maybe you know more that genetic aspect than um, socialization. They um, and just being reared by a, a nervous, fearful um, vixen. They took the some of the fox kits from the nervous ones and put them in with the more tame vixens, vice versa. And um, they, they were able to really show that there's a really strong genetic um, 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 selective bred, um, selectively breeding for um, domestic and um, social behavior in these foxes. Um, and that we can really make them more fearful and make them more tame in this short period of time. And I think the reason that's interesting is um, when we look at like our current sources of dogs, um, if we think about um, kind of our free ranging or street dogs, um, they probably tend to lean more towards the temperament of animal that would sort of stay on the periphery and sort of avoid human interaction. Um, and then, um, so that can be kind of a hard, hard thing for those puppies to be brought into a city where um, again, their genetics, their potential was that they were gonna be more shy and fearful and reactive and then um, bring them into this totally novel setting. Sometimes these dogs have a hard time adjusting. Um, and um, alternatively, you know, everybody, I think a lot of people know now puppy mills are undesirable, but even so in our practice, we see people that, you know, get a puppy maybe uncertain of its origin um, and then um, with breeders, and we can, sometimes they're very purpose-bred, sometimes they are like pet dog 
temperament um, being the number one focus for what they're breeding them for, maybe um, like uh, um, service dogs or things like that. And so the reason I kind of bring this up is that, I mean, we see a lot of shy, fearful dogs. We see a lot of great pet dogs. This is a big reason why doodles are so popular. Um, people want to get a dog from a, a source where these where they're being bred for temperament. And so um, um, it, it just kind of plays into, um, I guess, that we don't have as much control over any of these really early experiences um, that our dogs have. And so that when we talk about socialization, we're not really talking about socializing like you and I don't get to do anymore. This is as close as it gets for a while. Um, aside from work, of course, if you're lucky enough to get to go in like I do. Um, and so um, the socialization window, a lot of those dogs, regardless of source, like five to seven weeks, we don't have our hands on our puppies yet. Um, usually they find their way into a home at eight weeks. And so that's where like these really good um, reputable rescue organizations that are taking the puppies in and doing all these really important things early on. Um, reputable breeders that are breeding puppies for health and temperament and are exposing them to a lot of things that they'll be exposed to later on and throughout their life. Because by the time we get them at eight weeks, um, I've heard some people say maybe up to 20 weeks, but really even you know up to 12, maybe 16 weeks. So we have a very, very short period of time to get a lot of work done. So this is the time in their life that they're sort of, their mind is open to including things that are now gonna be considered normal. Um, and so if, you know, if this puppy never gets any exposure to the city and city noises, and they're just out in the country where it's very quiet in a barn, and then we suddenly bring them into the city, it might just be, we, we see it all the time where dogs are, are struggling and owners are struggling. And um, so sometimes we can't overcome those deficits, but there are things that we can try to do learning body language uh, to try to help them out. But again, we want to make sure that they have good associations um, to the things that we want them to uh, continue to be exposed to and expose them to a variety of people, animal, noises, um, places, all of those kind of things. Um, and so Jackie Nielsen is a behaviorist um, on the West Coast and she um, had this great like kind of um, list of, of key socialization points and I, I thought it was worth kind of sharing because you just, I, I like to think of it as building a brain of good associations. So um, just, you, we have to feed our dogs anyway. So use their, their puppy food um, out in public, giving them um, rewards. Now with COVID, of course, we have spacing, but which might actually be better because um, bad things really stick during this time too. So if they become overwhelmed or frightened, um, those kind of things can be really, really powerful and hard to overcome at this time as well. So when we get these little puppies, again, the socialization period is very short, expose them to lots of things in a very positive way, watching them for their, any sign that they might be overwhelmed. So again, we'll get into the body language kind of things, but if they are worried or upset, you're not gonna make things better by kind of trying to stick it out. Better to get them out of there and try to help them um, get comfortable again so that like that stress, cortisol, all the kind of stress association, and then it can kind of um, go back down and they can come back to baseline. Some of those things can be, as long as they're very um, minute um, and short-lived, those stresses can maybe help build resilience. But again, you don't want anything that's going to really scare them moving forward. And kind of back, like if you, know, if you live in the country and you think you might move into the city, bring them into the city, get them ex exposed to things or buy a... Um, uh, put on city noises on, on YouTube or something and have them hear those kind of things. If you think, you know, that your dog might ever be exposed to kids or grandkids, might be worth um, making sure that your puppy gets some positive exposure to kids well controlled to make sure that it's positive and nothing bad happens. Um, so this was a kind of a whole talk <laughs> that I did uh, not too long ago and with the help of Dana Emerson, our um, behavior technician, she has a great um, sheet that she made for us kind of at the beginning of COVID, um, talking about how to kind of do the best you can socializing during this time. So even just sitting out in your front yard with your puppy as 
um, people walk by now with blowing leaves and just kind of getting them exposed to things in a controlled way, lots of different surfaces and all those kind of things. Um, so we can still kind of socialize uh, even during this time. And I think um, I, I kind of thought it might lead to fewer kind of reactive maybe episodes for some dogs if everybody's sort of giving each other space and um, kind of respecting each other's bubbles, maybe it would end up being good and that um, dogs would not have some of these negative experiences inadvertently, they just happen. Maybe they'd be um, more, you know, more comfortable going forward. Um, but I already did have a, a friend of ours um, uh, did a little bit of work um, in our house and my <laughs> now two year old puppy was barking because no one has been in our house now really <laughs> since March. So um, I think, yeah, we're gonna have, we're gonna have see some challenges as a result of um, the new way of living, but um, we'll just, you know, try to do our best and be mindful of the future for these guys. Um, so after socialization, there are um, a couple of other developmental milestones and a lot of us um, kind of, I bring it up because a lot of us kind of see in dogs all of a sudden these changes at six to 18 months, depending um, at sexual maturity, that it changes their like social, social ability and how they're perceived by other dogs can change. So what before that, they were like a puppy and dogs that like puppies and tolerated puppies would be good to them. And then now they're kind of reaching this age that maybe the, those dogs are like, no, you're getting a little too big for your britches and maybe less tolerant of some of their antics. Um, and um, that's really when they're kind of getting more independent. And then social maturity comes later. And so this is another one of those times where um, we do see puppies with aggressive or fear related behavior for sure. And so we're working on that stuff right away when they're little, but um, at this age is all of a sudden when a lot of times dogs that maybe did like to play with other dogs or go to the dog park or socialize at um, doggy daycare or those kind of things, all of a sudden you're getting reports that like, strangely they're not that interested in other dogs anymore and it's actually relatively predictable based on their these milestones um i uh, got permission from sarah rushi we're really lucky to have um possibilities her company um here local in the metro um she created with um a great artist lily chin um these she has a whole bunch of different um flyers but this one i just think is so great because um, I don't love all people, but for some reason we expect our dogs to just kind of like continue to be social with everybody, um, you know, all along th throughout their whole life. And so this I think is kind of great because it kind of summarizes it where um, I've been lucky enough to have one of my first dogs was on that very social side of 10% where she just played with all the other dogs and had a great time. And so then I thought that was normal and it seemed strange to me then getting dogs that were kind of more in the, um, in the, in that bell curve, that 80% in the middle. So we have the dogs that are, you know, and these numbers are kind of rough, but it, it makes for a, a good cartoon and really kind of fits with what we see. So some dogs are kind of tolerant of dogs and kind of, you know, can get along and sort of go to the breweries when that was a thing and kind of ignore everybody and be fine. Then we get that little, the group of dogs that are kind of like dog selective. So they'll have a few friends, but just really anybody new, just give them space. They're not interested. Um, again, we all I think know people too. Like if we just think of it from that way too. Um, and then like there's that 10% of dogs that are really reactive and dog aggressive and um, owners have to work to manage that. And sometimes things get harder when people, um, you know, have the social dog and then that, that the dog uh, reactive dog is, is kind of um, more challenging to handle when all of us think the dogs are on that other end of the spectrum and love everybody else. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I hear um, dog owners coming in and they've been told by well-meaning friends and even professionals, veterinary and trainers and otherwise, where, you know, they're reactive, you know, bordering aggressive um, dog or even aggressive dog that, that A, that the owner did something wrong during socialization. Well, first of all, they, we know now that how important the genetics are and that can be really challenging to overcome if they are very much on that very sensitive and fearful side. Um, add to that, 
um, that m much of the time our source of dogs, we get them later, the window is closed. And so to tell me that my reactive barking three-year-old dog just needs to be socialized isn't helpful because it can't really be done. So I think if we can kind of change the way that we look at things, um, repeated exposure that's not positive is actually sensitization. And it's actually gonna make things worse over time. Dogs don't generalize well. So if I put in all this time to get my dog to like my neighbor dog, this is really important. They're gonna dog sit the dog while I'm out of town. Um, so I need these two dogs to be friends. That doesn't mean if I make those two dogs, if we work really hard and make those dogs become friends, that my dog is now gonna love all other dogs because they really just don't generalize very well. That's why when we teach them to sit, we start in one spot and then we start right away trying to bring it to all sorts of other places because it, it just doesn't mean the same thing in a new spot until we train that um, there as well. Um, and then, so really, um, we'll get into this a little bit, but this is kind of like the, how it applies in real life. We wanna really just focus on preventing undesirable behavior. That's a lot of that is done through management. So staying far enough away from the thing that makes our dog nervous um, and then training them what to do and helping them change their underlying emotion as much as we can. Um, so now we're gonna kind of dive into how, how we can read our dog's body language to kind of recognize earlier cues so it's not all of a sudden the ball of canine terror at the end of the leash um, when something, you know, when somebody gets close or whatever. We can kind of better predict by learning to watch their um, body language. And for dogs, um, of course, they have amazing sense of smell and they can hear so much better than we can and all of these other things. But um, visual communication, not verbal, right? Like us, I'm just yammering yeah, right on here. <laughs> but uh, the, for them, the, they do have some vocalizations, of course, um, but really it's that visual communication that is just the, the key to how they're observing us and how, how they initially chose you know, what people to come closer to um, when we think all the way back to the origins. Um, and so we wanna learn how to accurately interpret what they're saying to us. And then I think just for safety and recognizing how to help get them out of things before it's too late, um, recognizing what I like a lot of people like to call um, distance increasing behavior. So um, this is the um, ladder of aggression. Um, you can find it, it's like great, you know, you can find it on the internet, um, but it's a great visual for me and especially when talking to students and um, clients and family, everybody, um, if, we, if we start looking for these earlier cues down in this green area that my dog is nervous, um, so yawning when they're not tired, panting when it's not hot, um, walking away, um, creeping along, putting their ears back. Um, if we kind of, if we see these yellow, or sorry, these green and yellow, these sort of silent signals of stress, um, then hopefully we can make adjustments because we have the big frontal lobes and we can make adjustments, help prevent anything from escalating even higher. And so I know some people have been told, you know, again, back to that, like that myth about dominance or that aggression is um, them trying to like one up us or something. So when a dog is growling, and this is a com commonly people say, you know, punish them or, or yell at them or try to make them stop growling. And it's, a, it's, the intention is good. Our hope is that by punishing growling is that the dog will then not be aggressive. Unfortunately, it has the opposite effect in that A, we've confirmed that something is scary. So um, a child is approaching, the dog growls because they're not sure of children, they haven't been exposed to them, perhaps they've had a bad experience. Regardless, the dog growls and now the owner, you know, scolds the dog and tells them not to growl. They, meet, they mean well, they think they're teaching the dog not to be aggressive, but the, they've confirmed that now mom acts like a crazy person and yells at me and I don't like that. And the, I don't feel any better about the child. The dog internally doesn't have any better feelings about the child. In fact, now maybe even sensitized. So now the dog next time doesn't want to growl because they didn't want to, they don't want to get scolded or punished. 
And so instead of, and their underlying emotional state has not changed, they're still scared. Now they switch gears, they don't growl and they go right to snapping. So I am always, especially um, in the profession of having to unfortunately do unpleasant things to dogs sometimes as part of our job, um, I'm super grateful when they growl. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> I can adjust, I can, I can appreciate um, you letting me know how you feel. So I think um, we don't ever wanna um, punish any of these kind of things because we can just suppress the signaling, but we haven't changed the underlying emotional state. Um, so really briefly, this is just a, kind of a, a diagram of how bites happen out of nowhere, right? We all, it just happened out of nowhere. Well, there's um, trigger stacking is where, so these, um, the horizontal lines can be different for any dog um, for different stimulus. So this example of a dog, it takes a certain level of stress for them to show the silent signals. And then there's a little bit of space between that and growling. Some dogs that growl could be much higher. It can be variable. But for this example, um, after several other, you know, um, elevations, the dog will snap and then the dog will bite. So moving to the next one, um, this particular dog with their baseline for where, what level of stressor would lead them to do any of those signals on the ladder of aggression. Um, for this dog, if she's getting her head touched, maybe she's like yawning or turning away not feeling well, she's just avoiding being touched. Crowds of strangers, different context, she, you know, she pants and she kind of tries to hide behind her owner's legs. And then this particular dog will growl when children are around because she does not care for the little um, space alien <laughs> beings that come and grab and pull. So for this particular dog, this would be a situation where all of a sudden the dog out of nowhere snaps. So she doesn't like having her head touched. On this particular day, her hips are sore, she's not feeling well. We're in a group of strangers and suddenly a child approaches in that group. And so now the dog snaps. So if we're keeping these things, these body language signals that they're showing us and keeping the idea that any dog deserves to be able to show us that they're afraid or stressed out, um, this is how we can intervene and um, prevent. And I don't mean to focus on like aggression, I feel like, but I just, um, I feel like that's the only way I can prevent it. And so I'm like just looking for it all the time. And I've just sort of become, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate all, all dogs, even if they are aggressive or scared or nervous. Um, and so I just try to watch out for them as well. So um, we need to just recognize fear as the underlying motivation for a lot of these um, signals. It's not, again, that they're a bad dog or that they don't know their place in the pack or anything like that. Um, don't have time to get into it, but that appeasement, so when people say, oh, I know my dog is guilty because she's doing all these things, um, ears back, you know, smiling, doing the submissive grin, those kind of things, really what that dog is just telling you is that they're they're reacting to us because they read us like a book. And so that dog is like, she's upset. I'm going to do the things that maybe would make her not be as upset with me. And then if we inadvertently read that as guilt, there's a, a really cool study about that. Um, but um, I, again, I want to make sure that we have time for some of the questions, but they basically were able to show that um, how a dog responded um, when an owner came in the room after being told whether or not the dog left a treat, it was consistently the dog responded based on the owner's um, reaction of thinking the dog ate it, whether or not having been told that the dog ate it, whether or not the dog did or not. It didn't have to do with what the dog had done when we were out of the room. It was how we came in the room and um, acted that the dogs were doing these behaviors, these submissive kind of behaviors, appeasement behaviors. Um, and so I think we just really need to kind of as a culture, just kind of change our terminology and the way that we look at dogs rather than thinking that they're always trying to one up us or be in charge and that they're um, just trying to get their needs met and exist within a household. And so I think um, in vet clinics, um, the way that we're recommending to do that is by rather than saying like she's mad or angry or you know that dog is dangerous or those kind of things looking at it trying to be objective we say yellow green and red 
Um, so we'll look at these um, things in context in a minute. But as far as body language goes, we want to um, look at the whole picture. So there's each of these components and then putting them together can give us kind of the whole overall um, package. Um, if we look at just the tail, um, you know, when we look at this ready to play on this upper right hand corner, um, the high up wagging tail and defensive territorial dogs down at the bottom, the tail is also up high. So it has to do with like the whole rest of the body to tell um, the context overall. So um, um, everybody kind of knows that when that tail is down and tucked under, that's a dog that's afraid. Um, if the eyes, the whale eyes, kind of when we can see the white of the um, dog's eyes, um, that means that they're um, nervous or afraid. Ears, I mean, I just love how expressive <laughs> their ears are. I'm kind of a, I always end up with these dogs with like German Shepherdy or little prick ears. So I just love all the different, um, you know, one in each direction that they can do. Um, there's a lot to be read in how they're holding their ears as well as their mouth and then overall posture. So are they leaning forward or leaning back? So here's an example of um, kind of what we would say as a green dog. And I think everybody here, I know I'm talking to dog lovers. You just, you know, you know this would be safe to approach one of these dogs and in this moment. Of course, things could change in, with proximity of someone coming or whatever. But when you see these dogs, um, the, the shepherdy dog here, uh, well, both of them, they just have this really soft, relaxed mouth. Their tongue is out, they're panting, um, but um, it's not like a big stressed um, um, tongue. Um, they both have very relaxed eye um, and facial expressions. Ears are back in a neutral, comfortable um, position. Um, overall posture, obviously, he's laying down. He's happy, he's sitting on one hip, so that's a little bit more of a relaxed um, kind of posture for uh, that dog there. Um, and then this guy, um, just to kind of be able to see like a tail is just in a neutral, comfortable position, um, standing with equal weight on all four feet, again, with the comfortable, relaxed mouth and, you know, relaxed brow, ears are just <laughs> flying back in the wind. This dog is comfortable in his surroundings. These guys are the yellows. And so um, I have to say like, you know, of course, in the clinic, this is normal. I don't blame them. Um, so I'm very attuned to kind of these earlier signals. So um, this um, little dog here, this is that kind of that whale eye where you're seeing the white of, of the eye that you wouldn't, you can appreciate that her claws are even like she's kind of hanging on, her weight is shifted back. So even if someone like offered her a treat, she might pop in, but she's ready to get out of there. So that's saying I need some space. I'm trying to let you know um, that I could use a little space. Um, she has a really tight, like tight mouth and her brow is very furrowed. Ears are down back um, and, and tight up against her head. Um, and then this little dog, so same thing, the tail is tucked under, her weight is shifted back. When we see that one leg up, that paw up, that was on the ladder of aggression about, that's a, one of those earlier silent signals that she would like some space. Um, and um, her mouth is kind of tight and tense and maybe a little bit of uh, white um, on her eye as well. Um, so these are just a couple more examples. And I think it, the reason I just kind of chose a couple more is that um, these are kind of the, uh, to me, I didn't want to include any kind of photos of people with their dogs. Um, but if we just were to like, you know, think of any internet adorable picture or whatever, so often it's like a person you know, with their, uh, or a child next to a dog that actually is showing a lot of these yellow signals. So um, again, that the Australian Shepherd here is kind of like leaning away, um, looking up kind of in a nervous manner with the mouth kind of looking a little bit tighter, a little bit of furrow in the brow. Um, and then this dog, um, so I, I know that the, another kind of common misconception um, is that when a dog shows their belly, that they um, are being submissive and that they're soliciting attention. And it can be, there, it can be. So if one of those green dogs, everything about them was just soft and relaxed and you walked up and they just flopped over um, and, and you continue to watch for signs of consent if, if you come closer and they just like scoot towards you, things like that. It's all, you know, so many things and it's all just happening in sec just in seconds, so much can change. 
But this um, dog, it's, it's not uncommon for a dog when they are afraid to show their inguinal area asking for space. And this dog, the lip licking, um, um, he's kind of, you know, he's leaning back, his ears are down, you can see a little bit of the white of his eye. And unfortunately, this is kind of the thing that, you know, um, this is a, a time where bites happen pretty um, quickly is when, you know, somebody misinterprets what the dog is asking for, leans in, thinking they're doing the right thing, giving attention, and um, the dog is actually showing us in every way that that's the opposite of what they would want. And then everybody, right, when all of a sudden the hair stands up on the back of your neck. So um, these ones are showing a lot of behavior, kind of back maybe to the yellow, but sometimes in these, that like kind of absence of behavior when they're really still and really stiff, like this dog right here, like he, his face is scary, but he's probably like totally statue still. And you're like, ooh, that's weird. <laughs> Nothing's moving. Um, those, those are much easier to interpret and, and recognize. Um, but again, if our dog would maybe be in that yellow zone and then um, we, they'll get into this red zone if somebody's closer, um, we wanna just make sure that we get them out of that situation sooner. Um, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. So um, again, just really, we wanna do our best to read dog's body language, um, appreciate them for who they are and just do the best with what they come with um, as far as like, what level of socializing uh, with other animals for the rest of their lives they want to do. And we're going to um, do management is how we can kind of keep our dogs that would prefer more space out of trouble um, by not practicing barking on a leash at other dogs and reactive behavior, get them out of there. Um, um, because every time they practice that behavior, it just becomes reinforced and, and more of a pattern and harder to kind of change. Um, and then um, to teach them an alternative behavior. So my dog can't sit and look at me and eat treats and be jumping up and barking and facing the other direction at the same time. So keeping them below what makes them nervous, practicing a different behavior um, um, so that they can be successful in, in settings um, where they may come into proximity with other dogs if that's something that we need from them. Um, so there's just tons of information out there. These are all actually relatively old, but that um, using reward-based um, training methods um, makes the relationship better, allows for more trust. Um, these dogs continue to perform better on novel tasks. They um, have less attention seeking, um, more consistent behavior because they kind of know what's expected and they know how to perform um, in, in whatever situation you put them in. Um, they know what to do. Aversive, so the um, Veterinary Behavior Society has a, a whole page on position statements where they, um, they have a position statement on punishment and it really just focuses on the fallout um, if we use those methods. It um, harms the relationship, it leads to less trust, and then those dogs can sometimes act more aggressively in the future, like we talked about, if we take the batteries out of the fire alarm, um, we've take, taken away some of their language and signaling, and then um, they maybe experience pain or discomfort, and now they're more likely to be aggressive in other situations in the future. So um, we wanna be a good leader. We wanna um, find out what motivates the dog. They have to eat anyway, so we can use that. It doesn't mean they'll need food for all eternity. It can just be used to teach them new behaviors. It can help them form um, better emotional responses to things that maybe would make them nervous otherwise. Um, and we um, don't wanna inadvertently reward um, undesirable behaviors. It, you know, so if they're sitting there and pawing at you and then you're petting them, <laughs> uh, that, that's, if, that's not, if that's not something we want them to do, we have to find a new way to get them to do something else. And again, really just um, focusing on what to do rather than like the one million things we don't want dogs to do. And we can't, focusing on trying to punish all of those things versus just rewarding the like five or six things that we want them to do uh, frequently. It's a much bigger undertaking. And their, their, uh, their relationship with you will be better um, for following these methods. So um, I kind of rushed a little bit at the end, but when I heard 200 um, questions, <laughs> um, I thought maybe we'd leave a little, little more time at the end. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Flynn, uh, for such a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot um, that I can use in working with my own dog too. So with that, let's jump to all those questions um, from our attendees. First one up, how can we read dogs' reactive behavior when two dogs, yours and others, meet in categories like, I'm calm, which is very safe, I'm overexcited, but likely safe, I'm anxious, scared, or iffy, and I'm aggressive, reactive, not safe at all. So hopefully some of that is kind of um, covered with the um, paying attention to kind of being able to see those earlier signs. Um, so I think the more in tune we can be to, I mean, things can change in just a second, I guess is the other thing. So while things look like I'm calm and I'm very safe um, and the two dogs are loose and comfortable, um, it can quickly kind of elevate or change for any one of the individuals. And so I think the main thing for me would be that each owner is kind of educated and aware of what their dog may or may not do in this situation. And then each person is just really, instead of sitting there and visiting with each other, you're watching for those signals in your own dog. And then it's, again, a cultural thing. Oh, it looks like she's not comfortable. We'll see you later. But instead that feels so hard to do because it feels like it's an insult to the other person or their dog. But if we could all just say, oh, he's just done now. It's gone into like, I'm not safe anymore. And actually stopping before we ever get into that zone. Um, um, again, hopefully they don't practice that behavior. So if I start to see some of those earlier signals that things aren't okay, um, get them out of there and just um, call, it, call it a good interaction before things get further along. <laughs> yeah, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, the next question we have is, how can you tell if a response is a fear versus aggression? Um, so I think fear is like the underlying motivation for uh, most of the sort of episodes of aggression. So when a dog is sitting on the couch, again, if now that we know we can look at those kind of that ladder of aggression, those kind of things, they're sitting on the couch and a person comes over and approaches and they're just on their warm, comfortable spot. They maybe are, you know, nervous about a, a kid or something like that. Like a lot of times their fear or anxiety is a little part of that. Like, oh, I don't want to get up and move. It's not that they're like, this is my spot and trying to be like aggressive. Although territorial aggression is a real thing. So if, you know, your dog is barking at the yard, at the, in the, at the fence when other dogs go by, that really could be a different kind of aggression. Um, but a, a lot of kind of like, um, relationship like aggression or, or things between human and their own dog a lot of times it's like oh the last time you could touch my foot you cut my nails and now now they're like afraid when you touch their feet so i think it's a it's a it's a fluid you know it's a continuum but i think a lot of times um real outward aggression there are dogs like that and they're unfortunate but most of them it's like they're kind of responding they're showing you to give them a little space with those aggressive behaviors yep Makes a lot of sense for sure. Okay, um, how do you give a fearful dog more confidence and how do you build that resilience in your dog? Yeah, so I think um, we talked a little bit about resilience in puppies, like maybe like minimal stress, like a little bit of stress, healthy stress, and then get them out of there. Um, so that can be kind of a way of building resilience. But overall, I think to give a fearful dog more confidence, show them that you will protect them, give them confidence in you. And so that's hard because again, um, I, you have to say, stop, my dog is nervous around other people. Please don't come any closer. And that's COVID <laughs> with like, yay, but no, under normal circumstances, like it's hard because the, the person feels offended because you have a dog. And obviously I love dogs and I should get to come in and pet your dog, but we don't do that with each other's, with people's children either. So I think the way to build your dog's confidence is to say, I have your back. All you have to do is sit and look at me and eat treats or follow me out of here. I'll get you out of here and I have your back. And I think over time they can become more confident um, knowing that, that they won't ever be overfaced or put in a position where they feel really scared. Yep, yep. This next one I've definitely heard a lot from clients. Um, my dog has trouble saying hi when on a leash, but fine is, is fine when they're off leash. Why might this be? And I think we always kind of hear that like our tension, like just like <laughs> a line down the leash, but I think um, I, I, I think, again, I don't like to blame 
us or owners either too much like, oh, if only you would just be the right way, your dog wouldn't do that. That's not helpful or actionable at all either. So um, I think there is that little bit of that like kind of um, tight leashes. Um, it does like just have a physical effect on the dog. They're feeling that tension, they're pulling against it. Um, and then um, I think there is that little bit of like barrier frustration or those kind of things. So um, it's, it's definitely a real thing. And so again, maybe the prevention, ounce prevention, just don't let your dog meet other dogs on leash. It's hard because we all think all dogs want to meet all other dogs, but if they don't want to and reliably they snap or growl or bark, it doesn't matter how good those five minutes leading up to that are, we're better off just saying, oh no, she's actually, she's good. When she's on the leash, she doesn't need to meet other dogs. Thanks though. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we got this one um, a lot in different forms. This next question, how do you address dogs who are feel fearful of certain people? So for example, people in uniforms or people who are taller. I feel like everybody's gonna be like, so her rule is just to avoid everything. <laughs> 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 but kind of again, it feels like, yeah, my answer is like, well, then just don't expose them to, but I know it's not always that easy. So I think when we can predict that someone is going to be coming into the house to do some work or something like that, um, a Kong with a fro you know, frozen food in it or um, something like that. And then if they're comfortable in a crate in a bedroom or somewhere where they can just be kind of kept away. Um, if and then they don't generalize well. So if you work really hard on the, on the um, postal worker and the dog learns that every time they come, a treat comes through the, the mail slot and they start to anticipate that in some kind of good way, that doesn't mean that they would like respond the same way to a police officer or a UPS man where the suit is just different. So since they don't generalize so well, it's way easier to manage that than to try to actually change their underlying emotional state for every single uniformed person that they might encounter. But mm. if someone new in your life is a postal worker, then you might have to <laughs> have them learn that that person is okay. Sure, sure. All right, this is um, calls back to one of the things that you talked about in the presentation. So my dog is very playful and even shows her teeth in what appears to be aggressive. Um, nature, but sh is she playing or is she showing her teeth in that she's always doing the red signal or can be, can it be part of playing too? Uh, that's a really good one. So there are some really um, much more detailed kind of like um, I've seen continuing education, things like that that I've seen. I know there are some really good like um, images and things out there that kind of can explain. So there's a, without seeing it and um, looking at the whole context, it can be really hard but showing teeth is part of play. And so if it's between dogs, um, generally speaking, if it's loud and big open mouths and you can kind of see all their teeth and they're kind of like clanking around and snarling and stuff, a lot of times that's comfortable, happy play. It's when it gets quiet and things get tighter and tense that that might be more of a sign that things are tending to lead towards aggression. Um, I also know some dogs have that like grin and it's like I jump and I'm like, oh, you're a grinner? okay, because they just come in like teeth bared and, and it's like, it can be kind of startling because, um, and so it's possible that for that dog, if that's part of the game and part of the play, um, that that, that um, could just be that that's what the bearing the teeth is. Hmm. Um, I'd say if this person's dog hasn't bitten them so far and it's not, they're doing the right thing to try to not, um, you know, get things beyond they should maybe um, take video and share it with their vet or work with like a local trainer, like um, with Sarah Rushi's group at Possibilities or something that we know is really in tune to reading body language. I have a feeling that if, if they've had the dog for a while and, and they ha haven't pushed it too far, it's probably that the dog is maybe playing because it it's pretty easy to accidentally push a dog too far if they're kind of in that red zone. It does not take much, like one false move and and they might just snap and warn you, um, but you'd know it. <laughs> You'll know yeah. it. Sure. So then what are some more don't tools? Don't by your dog. <laughs> Take yeah. <it> professional. <laughs> yep. Um, so building on some of those redirects, um, what are some tools that you can use to positively reinforce not excitedly barking at other dogs or lunging or similar behaviors? Yeah. 
So it really starts by practicing in a very low distraction environment. So we want to get some of these behaviors about like, so I want, I want, like that's where that the the condition classic conditioning like I say sit and my dog has gotten so many treats for sitting in her two years that she just sits and it's like Pavlov she just like drools because the word sit and the action of sitting just means that something wonderful is happening so I'm trying to build that and build that so that you know if my dog gets and then start taking notes so my dog reacts and starts barking and lunging when a dog is 12 feet away so then go somewhere where you can try to be 12 14 plus feet away and practice that sit for two, three minutes and then get out of there. And so the more you can, and then eventually over time, you can try to like work up to getting a little bit closer and closer. And again, you need those people to reliably give you space so that you can keep your dog under that threshold. But that's how that, that's how that starts. It starts by just getting those, some of those cues really reliable with no distraction and then starting below threshold and trying to build up. But it's really intense. It's really intense. And some dogs are really beyond kind of just normal kind of woofing and reacting. And sometimes it's hard because that dog loves all other people and they're doing it like they're dragging you <laughs> across, uh, you know, because they just, all people and dogs mean fun things, but that's still not fair to the old geriatric dog that now that dog comes up and tries to play with or whatever. So, yep. Yep. All right, the next question you touched on, um, but maybe if you could give some more insight to this, how do I socialize my dog to other dogs and people during the pandemic when I'm trying to limit interactions with people right now? Yeah, I'm gonna be really interested to kind of see how this experiment sort of plays out. I'm hopeful that um, maybe a lack of negative experiences might during their socialization period might actually be a benefit. So I try, I'm trying to, um, be optimistic about that as much as I can. Um, but I think if, you know, if you have a, a neighbor that you trust um, that, that could come over in your backyard, if it's fenced in and the dog could be loose, you know, and they could go, you could be distanced from the person um, wearing masks um, and trying to, you know, hand sanitizer, kind of doing those kind of things. But puppy fur isn't probably like a, a spot that it's going to transfer from one person to another as far as um, what we know so far. So I think if you could find ways to still be distanced from the other person and your puppy could go, if you have a good friend, maybe that you trust, again, you have to, you know, um, that the, the dog could go and spend some time with them. If they have kids and you don't, you know, finding um, opportunities like that where you know the kids are respectful and safe. Um, I'm too much of a control freak I would have to be there to know that like nothing bad is happening. Um, but I think still going to the store, um, you know, taking them to PetSmart or Petco and, but again, like maybe we can still let them know that other people are going to be around, but I think sometimes they get overwhelmed and we don't know to get them out of there or it's uncomfortable socially. And so sometimes those things end up being bad experiences rather than good experiences. So I think, I think um, just do your best and um, keep, get them around other dogs that you know are safe and dog friendly and up to date on vaccinations, all those kind of things. We never recommended puppies go to dog parks or uncontrolled places anyway. So I think um, sticking to a couple good safe um, people or other dogs. Um, some of the um, classes are going on now at some training facilities like Twin Cities Obedience Training Club. Um, and some of the other um, classes are, are going now. And Humane Society, I think, is offering them again. So you should be able to get some of that stuff in. And, and then it's under a supervised environment or in a supervised environment, which might even be um, better than kind of left to our own devices. Yeah. Yeah, this next question is sort of an add on to that. It relates to um, the pandemic and the changes in our behavior right now as people. Um, so how can I prevent my dog from getting separation anxiety when I'm at home all the time right now and will likely return to not being at home all the time at yeah. one point? I've thought about that a lot as well. Um, and um, I was kind of reassured. I listened to a presentation by um, Nick Dodman, who is a behaviorist um, in Massachusetts, and he actually um, said that um, what sets dogs up, what seems to set dogs up for separation anxiety in the future for some dogs, and luckily it's not super common. I mean, there can be some degree, but um, the ones that have are kind of more severe, um, it seems like there is some like abrupt change 
in their early life. And he suggested that just like human children, like babies, infants, the more time that they're held and with their like closest people as much as possible, actually like the more resilient and stuff they can be later. So actually when they're a young puppy, they're meant to just be like with us all the time. It's never been an option for a lot of us, but if that happened, it doesn't mean that they won't tolerate it in the future. In fact, they might actually have a more solid foundation and emotional kind of um, resilience that might lead to it not being a problem. But that being said, I would practice. So still plan on having your dog, um, you know, crate training your dog, lots of great resources out there about how to make that like a wonderful place for your dog where they run, I get a Kong out and my dogs run to their kennels because they just know that something great is coming. They're like, see ya. Um, and so if we can start that earlier, as soon as we get the dogs and then um, if they don't have a negative history um, with that um, and then practice that. So I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna have you be in your kennel for an hour while I'm working. Um, or if I, you know, just running an errand or even just like going on a walk. I know we all like to walk with our dogs, but maybe even just having the dog be in the house for 20 minutes while you go on a short walk by yourself, just to kind of practice those departures and um, making like me leaving is a good thing um, so that, that you kind of have that in, in your um, playbook for later on, I think is kind of the best that we can do. Yeah, that's great. So this next one relates to um, situations actually in the vet clinic. So my dog is quite fear aggressive at the vet clinic. Sedation doesn't erase this. Can you talk a little bit about fear-free practice and the benefits it has? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry for that. Cause I, I know like um, Dana and I, like we're, we have this niche market where we <laughs> see these dogs that have to sadly like be like all the way knocked out to have anything done. And I just, I feel so, so bad for the dogs, for the owners. I know how stressful it is um, for the care team, like all around, it's really tough. Um, and so um, I, I guess I would just for one thing, just say some dogs are just gonna probably be that way. So we have seen, you know, the first time it's come in a, a four or five month old puppy and you can hardly touch them. They are so sensitive about space and strangers and those kind of things. And so it could be that that was just gonna be how that dog was gonna be regardless. But certainly they're so smart. If they come in because they were hit by a car, like a dog that's been good all along and now they have this like painful experience and you know, and we have you repair whatever is broken or whatever. Um, and then they can just be like traumatized and for life and just remembering that. So. We try to do, I, I think a lot of clinics, you can look and find a lot of them out there doing fear-free um, kind of practices. And it's, it's preventing and doing your best, but at some, sometimes um, once they've already been exposed and sensitized and afraid, it can be really, the fear-free handling can go so far, but for those dogs that have already had a really traumatic experience, sometimes it can be really hard to come back. Um, but otherwise there's kind of cool push to teach um, consent to care. Um, for your own pet where you, you know, let them sort of like eat cheese while you're cutting nails. And if they stop eating the cheese, then you stop and give up. So there, there are all kinds of like methods out there. And I just think um, the last thing we want to do is like have a dog come in to the vet clinic and then like leave with behaviorally broken. Like that is under no circumstances is that like okay if it's preventable at all. So better living through chemistry, gentle, you know, wants versus uh, do we all the needs that day and maybe skip the wants, come in for like a sedated exam um, when they're kind of like under or something like that so that you can do things more thoroughly. Um, but oh, I feel bad because I know that's one of the hardest things I think in, in our profession just seeing those dogs that really struggle and wishing there was something that I, a magic wand that would just make it better. They'd like, they're like, everything's fine. You practice happy visits and petting and all this stuff. And then the minute a needle comes out, they're like, yeah, I know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sure. All right. Let's squeeze in one more question. Um, so my dog is 15 months old and started to bark and vocalize loudly during play with new dogs. Is this a sign of social maturity? It sure could be. If, if you saw an abrupt change, Sometimes um, 
without seeing it, sometimes it can be kind of pushy, demanding, like wanting to play more in aggressive, like just more rough housing. It might be that their play style isn't being met, um, or it could be that the other dogs are giving them the signals like, hey, you're too much, and then they're barking back. So it would be interesting now um, to kind of, re you know, reflect um, while watching um, them play and just see. And if it's behavior that the other dogs are giving signals that they're not into, just get your dog out of there and go do something else, take a good break so that we don't inadvertently, um, you know, keep rewarding that behavior so that that pushy stuff kind of gets worse um, over time. Sure, sure. Well, thank you, Dr. Flynn, um, for your presentation and your insights. Um, and many thanks to all of you for sharing such thoughtful questions. Uh, we wish we had time to get to more of them. <laughs> uh, but as always, the VMC is here for you. If you have questions for your veterinarian or our care team, um, if you want to learn more about how you can support our mission, you can um, visit our website or send us an email. And then philanthropic investments are strengthen our team. They drive life-saving treatments and they inspire new discoveries in veterinary medicine. So next month, uh, the VMC Animal Health Education Series will welcome Dr. Julie Churchill, whose presentation, Deciphering Fact from Fiction, What's the Best Food for My Pet, will answer pressing nutrition questions. And we want to thank you again uh, for attending tonight, and we hope that you and your families are well during this time. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.